Hello, my name is Alex Marshall. I'm a group director at Clark Energy, a cola company. I sit on the executive committee of the Cogen World Coalition and also on the council of the World Biogas Association. This particular presentation will focus on combined heat and power or CHP technology and how it will support the transition to net zero carbon. Clark Energy is an international specialist in gas-based power and energy solutions. Globally, we've got eight gigawatts of power generation installed across 28 countries. 1.4 gigawatts of this is focused on campus energy and district energy schemes. Combined heat and power, or CHP technology, is the high efficiency generation of electricity and heat close to the site of use, helping to negate transmission losses and in parallel generating efficiencies close to 90% compared to centralized power stations which achieve 60%. This technology is able and is currently delivering both cost and carbon savings to numerous installations globally. Whilst typically natural gas fueled, there are a range of low carbon and renewable fuels that can be utilized in it. And it will be able to deliver tangible carbon savings till the mid 2030s in most countries. At a basic level, a CHP engine module consists of an engine much like that you'll find in a car, albeit on a larger scale, a generator, a heat exchanger, and a control panel. Gas is burned in the cylinders of the engine, driving a crankshaft, which generates electricity. Heat can be recovered from the cooling circuits of the engine and also from the engine exhaust. CHP module basics on a simple level consists of an energy balance. So when you consider 100% of the energy in the fuel gas is typically converted at electrical energy efficiency of around 40 to 46%. Thermal energy recovered from the engine cooling circuits and the engine exhaust is typically somewhere between 40 and 50%, giving a total energy efficiency of 90% with roughly 10% losses. Specifically, there are a number of different phases of the engine itself where these heat level is recovered from, and there is a small level of additional heat which is typically vented to atmosphere, but could also theoretically be used for recovery itself as well. This is an example of how a CHP engine can provide tangible electricity and carbon savings versus the separate purchase of electricity from the grid and gas which is utilised in a boiler. So in, in case one, 4.33 kilowatt hours of energy input into a system drives one kilowatt hour of electricity, 1.25 kilowatt hours of heat, but you have an overall loss of roughly two kilowatt hours. Compared to a CHP engine, the same energy content of the fuel gas is 2.5 kilowatt hours, giving you the same one kilowatt hour of electricity, 1.25 kilowatt hours of heat, but with only 0.25 kilowatt hours of loss. This translates to a 42% primary energy saving. When you look at the CO2 em emitted from both systems, the first example pr produces almost a kilogram of CO2. The second example provides roughly half of that, so a 48% CO2 reduction from using CHP versus your separate purchase of electricity from the grid and heat from gas in a boiler. The energy trilemma is what is grappling many different energy managers at campuses, data centers, commercial industrial facilities globally. It's how to balance the need globally for emissions reduction, along with the drive to keep the lights on, i.e. energy resilience, and all of that also considering the economics of the scheme, how much it costs to install, but also operate the installation into the future. And we see different groups of installations uh, having different drivers on the whole. Military and data centres are razor sharp focused on resilience. Campus uh, institutional facilities have historically been more open to emissions reduction, although keeping the lights on and making sure that the research is kept uh, secure and, and running is also highly important. And then on the economic side, we see commercial industrial facilities and also remote power generation installations like that at mines being very focused on economics. So our first example is of combined heat and power technology being deployed at campuses across Boston Public Schools in Boston in the USA. Here, 25 schools or educational facilities across the greater Boston area delivered a number of different CHP engines supplying their electricity and heat needs for the schools, typically ranging from 70 to 250 kilowatt hours or kilowatts of energy output. They are fueled at the moment by pipeline natural gas and were originally supported largely by local incentives, although currently the difference between the gas and energy prices still makes them very viable. 
and these sites were installed between 2004 and 2019. Another country with a long history of utilisation of CHP technology, partly due to its climate, is Scotland. We saw our first CHP district energy scheme at a campus facility installed in Dundee in the late 1990s. In addition, Edinburgh University, Glasgow University, amongst a number of others, have deployed CHP technology. This particular example is Glasgow Caledonian University, which not only has a CHP plant, but also uses this facility as a teaching and demonstration facility for students. It's an 845 kilowatt Yambaka CHP engine. It was installed in 2013, and we were delighted for it to be awarded highly commended by the CHPA Awards, the UK's Combined Heat and Power Association. So what's next for CHP technology? Being historically natural gas fueled or, or biogas fueled, how is it going to adapt to the transition to net zero carbon? So firstly, CHP does not necessarily need to be sort of fueled by a fossil fuel. Whilst natural gas has historically been the largest use of the technology, it is also able to be fueled by renewable natural gas. It can be fueled by biogas and has many hundreds of sites globally, typically at wastewater treatment plants, at waste treatment facilities, and at landfill sites. Hydrogen is another fuel which has historically been used in gas engines, typically in blends, initially at furnace gas facilities where you're smelting metals. More recently, there's been the focus to operate on either fully hydrogen fuel sources or alternatively blends with natural gas as we seek to decarbonize the gas distribution networks. So, for a campus facility wanting to convert to hydrogen, what are the current options available from an engine perspective that's available today? INEO's Yambaka gas engines are available with a 4 series unit, which is typically on natural gas, able to generate up to 1.5 megawatts of electricity. For hydrogen operation, this would sit between 500 kilowatts and 1 megawatt. There are three different engine versions available, able to operate on anywhere from 0 to 100% hydrogen or, or blends in between. For a natural gas engine supplied today, this can itself accept anywhere typically from 20 to 30% hydrogen alongside the natural gas fuel mix. If you want to go higher than that, you need to speak to your local service engineer or local supply company to look to convert that to operate on hydrogen and add the right technologies to achieve that. So how does blending hydrogen with natural gas result in decarbonization? At a basic level, natural gas will emit around about 203.75 grams of CO2 per each kilowatt hour generated. If you look to blend 20% hydrogen, which is what we're gonna find in many of these gas distribution networks, at least in the first phase, we're gonna achieve a 7% CO2 reduction, i.e. it is not a linear relationship. When you get closer to 90 to 100% hydrogen is when you see the greatest contribution towards decarbonisation. It's also possible to link gas engines directly with electrolyzers. Electrolyzers convert water into hydrogen and oxygen with electricity, using a renewable electricity source to drive an electrolyzer, and then potentially with storage and or blending with natural gas prior to putting into a gas engine. From a hydrogen blend perspective of 20%, as we discussed before, renewable electricity you will need to run that will be around about 0.25 megawatt. The electrolyzer will generate five kilograms of CO2 per hour, and that will support a one megawatt gas engine. If you want to go all the way to 100% hydrogen blend and achieve that full decarbonization, you'll need 3.75 megawatts of electricity, along with an electrolyzer generating 75 kilograms an hour of hydrogen. From a CO2 capture, recovery and conversion perspective, there are a range of different technologies which have already been deployed at gas engine sites and CHP sites globally. Firstly, at greenhouses and glasshouses, we've seen the use of catalysts to clean the engine exhaust of CHP engines, to remove nitrous oxides, which is detrimental to plant growth, and to enrich the air or the growing air of glasshouses, providing a boost to the plants to grow as plants take in carbon dioxide. We're also seeing this technology or similar technology using amines deployed at beverage and soft drinks manufacturers. Here there's a requirement typically to import CO2 for carbonisation and if you use a CHP engine on the site you can instead recover the engine exhaust. Using amines you can recover the um, CO2 to FDA quality standards and use that as an alternative for imported CO2. One of the challenges here is the cost of the system 
However, if you do have a cost for CO2, and in recent years we found CO2 to actually and ironically be quite costly to acquire, you can use your own generated on site with a CHP engine. For advanced carbon capture utilization and storage technologies, there's a range of technologies in the infancy. They are typically looking to lock up the carbon dioxide as a mineral form. We're seeing that be either low-grade aggregates or alternatively anywhere up to high-grade calcium carbonates which can have saleable value. We're seeing this deployed at the moment at wastewater treatment plant facilities and the main input to these systems is brines or salt water. This next example is of a real-life demonstrator for this type of technology. Here, Seven Trent, a major wastewater treatment plant operator, has been working in consortium with ourselves at Clark Energy with a carbon capture machine, with Brunel University and a range of other wastewater treatment plant operators in the UK. Here, a, an existing biogas engine is going to be retrofitted with a carbon capture machine. The input to this system will be brine and the output from this system is set to be high-grade calcium carbonate and calcium magnesium carbonate. This technology in turn, or this, this, this product in turn, will be able to be supplied to manufacturers requiring high standards calcium carbonate, such as uh, toothpaste, such as paints. So you could potentially have this as a saleable product whereby you're painting the wall and you're reducing uh, global CO2 emissions. This is a net carbon reducer, as the, ca the carbon here is from short-term carbon cycle, which if you're pulling out of the atmosphere will actually be net reducing carbon dioxide in the, in the global atmosphere. This particular installation is an 800 kilowatt CHP unit, and we're anticipating the engineering construction to commence within this next year, 2023. So when considering how um, combined heat and power technology is going to integrate with other systems, we see at the moment great reductions in the cost of solar PV, of uh, wind turbines, and of battery energy storage systems. However, typically all of these systems have their limitations. Solar PV and wind will only generate electricity when the wind blows or sun shines. Battery energy storage systems do not generate energy themselves and have a limited discharge period. So CHP engines can and will feature as part of microgrids. In addition, CHPs don't just consider electrical energy, but also thermal energy. And CHP engines can support thermal microgrids as well as electrical microgrids. So when looking at a microgrid, or electrical and thermal microgrid, we consider the anchor technology typically being a CHP engine or potentially a battery energy storage system. Solar PV and wind turbines will generate electricity, albeit intermittently. Heat pumps are a technology which is being used to decarbonize heat, but unfortunately this also requires electricity. And if we're, if we're moving to decarbonize heat, we need sources of electricity. In addition to this, a microgrid controller is able to optimize all of these technologies which do similar or slightly different things in order to dispatch at the best possible time, maybe peak shift, to provide an overall resilient system. In addition, you can also look to incorporate the generation of the gas on the site as well, with it be biogas upgrading, generating biomethane or renewable natural gas, or alternatively electrolyzers which generate hydrogen from water. This first example of a campus-based microgrid is a small yet very complex installation. It's a repurposed Woodrow Wilson Middle School in Connecticut in the USA. It's been converted into the Middletown Recreation Center, incorporating both municipal offices, gyms, pools, and a dedicated department building. Not only this, it will also act as a shelter for the local homeless community in severe weather incidents. And this facility uses a CHP engine as the anchor. It has backup gas and generation sources. We use a 10 kilowatt hour battery energy storage system, an 83 kilowatt solar PV array, and a microgrid controller, optimizing all these sources of power generation and storage, and optimizing that for the, for the operators. The facility is going to be funded by Excalibur Rural Capital. And finally, a real life demonstration of CHP being integrated with heat pump technology. Here at the Cheer Farm Glasshouse in the UK, it, we see one of the largest CNI uh, sector heat pump projects in Europe for over the past few years. It incorporates three CHP engines, generating nine megawatts of electrical energy and also thermal energy. In addition, the electricity from the CHP engines is used to drive water source heat pumps, giving a total of 33 megawatts of thermal output and the majority of that being renewable.
with 6,000 meter cubed of thermal stores. We also see the engine exhaust pass through a Codenox system to enrich the growing air of the tomatoes and to take some of that further CO2 out of the atmosphere. Thank you for your time watching this presentation. Please feel free to contact me in the future.